we're in the end of days. And the, the Bible said that uh, we're going to have birth pangs. And uh, the birth pangs are going on. There are wars and rumors of wars. You can uh, watch those. They're everywhere. And I can tell you part of them have to do with judgments. Uh, not going to go into too much detail on that. But um, anyway, you can, you can know that that's what part of it is. We're going to have a really soon here, we're going to have a war called the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war. And it's going to be a short war. It won't be a long one. But I think it will be before the catching away, the rupture of the church. Um, in uh, the Mexi I, was, I was checking today uh, where the wicked weather is, you know, and the Bible says it's going to come. Now, these are all signs. And uh, there are fires in, of course, Kelowna, Montana. You know what happened in Maui. And now they've come to Oahu and uh, Greece. And uh, heavy rain and hail in France. Floods in China, Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, an earthquake in Bogota, Colombia. Uh, high damaging winds in Kuwait. And I read where one person said it seems like a part of the world is on fire and another part of it is flooding. So uh, these are the birth pangs. And uh, isn't it wonderful to have inside information, inside the word of God, let not your heart be troubled, and to know of the things that are what is going on here. Uh, I want to show you the chart of days, and I want to show you why these are called the end of days, if you'll show that chart of days. There you go. That's it. Um, this uh, came, uh, it's in the Talmud, uh, Sanhedrin uh, 97a. And it is the oral, it's part of the oral tradition. When Moses went up to heaven, he went up on the mountain, we know that, but he just didn't stop there at the mountain. He went up to the throne of God at least twice. And uh, he was there for 40 days and nights. And he got the Ten Commandments. He got a download of the Torah. And he also got something called the oral tradition. The oral tradition, he was given it orally. He was, he was to give it to Joshua Joshua was to speak it to another, and it was to go down, down, down like that. It was never to be written. But when they were dispersed after the Romans destroyed their temple, they destroyed, they needed to write it down. So this is part of the early, early part of the sages. And uh, when Moses uh, was caught up to heaven, he was told that Adam was given a six-day work week, that God had worked with earth, six days, and then there would be a seventh day of rest. The Shabbat, the uh, seventh day. Now, he was told uh, Adam was essentially the god of this world. But you know what happened. You know that Satan came in, and um, he usurped the authority, and he set up a double kingdom system over the earth, and now he's called the god of this world, the prince of the powers of the air. Remember that? So, um, but when it was essential, when it was given, essential, uh, in the beginning to Adam, it was a lease. Adam had a lease on this earth. And it's a six-day lease. And each day is a thousand years. Psalm 90 and also 2 Peter tells us that with the Lord... A day is a thousand years. A thousand years is as a day. A day is as a thousand years. So these days are the six days. And those six days are divided into three parts. The first two are called the days of chaos. Then the Torah came, the law came, written word. Then there were to be two days of the, of the days of Torah. Then at the end of the fourth day, the Messiah is to come. And they are to begin, end, and they are to have the last two days, the end of days. Well, in the uh, Sanhedrin 97a, and you can go and see it, they have an asterisk. And they have it down at the bottom of the page. And it says, he didn't come because we were not worthy. But we Christians believe he came. And he came exactly at the right time. With God, there are right times, right dates. There's a moed. There's a moed. There's a date when Jesus is coming back. Really, you don't have anything to do with it. You can't hasten the day in any way of causing it coming sooner. And that means hasten the day means in your heart you look forward to it. So that day is picked out, and it's not far away. 
So Adam of earth is billions of years old. Charlie, I heard that he was preaching on this early on, uh, the difference in time between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. Earth is billions of years old, however old earth, true science needs. But Adam came here 6,000 years ago. And so we, uh, we are at, it's been 2,000 years since the Messiah came. So we are at what is called the end of days. When Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost, he said, these are the end of days, what Joel preached. Well, he was at the beginning of them. But now here we are and we're at the end of them. I don't know exactly what day that's going to be. I do study the Shemitah cycles. I could spend another week here and tell you what I think. Da, 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 da. But let's just leave it tonight is it's getting close and Jesus is coming soon. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Then there will be. Now, you notice I put a week there uh, right at the end of this end of days. Uh, God had the uh, Israelites to divide the years into weeks, weeks of years. And they were to every seventh year, they were to have a sabbatical, a sabbatical year. And uh, so then, uh, well, I'm, I'm just kind of talking around in circles here and trying to get Daniel and Revelation and all of this over to you. Take the three VI courses. But there's going to be, there are periods of uh, seven years and they're called weeks of years. And so there is a... The coming of the Lord is actually going to be in two parts. The first of that seven years, he's going to appear in the heavenlies, and we're going to go with him. And in the last of that seven years, uh, he's going to come back on the earth on a white horse, and we're going to be with him. And so, uh, bless the Lord, hallelujah. We're going up for the married supper of the Lamb. We're going to talk about some of these things tonight. Uh, bless the Lord. Now. What is going to go on in our future? What now? What do we look for next? Well, I already told you that you can look for pretty soon here uh, the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war. Um, but one thing for us, the body of Christ, that we're looking for is a great move of God. Hallelujah. Now, I don't know do any, how many of you know that for many years I was Brother Kenneth e. Hagin's uh, editor. Of publications. I, I did his books. He taught the lessons. I put them in books in written form, word of faith, etc. And I was very close to Brother Hagen for years when I worked for him and then even after I left. And uh, it was while I was working for him that this prophecy came. And it's about that great end time move of God. Uh, and he said, uh, we're, going, we're going to have this... Um, Praise the Lord and things, uh, he said, you'll go into it like a, like a flowing creek. It'll happen. And he said, if, it if you'll give the more earnest heed unto the things which you've heard, not only things you've heard about faith, healing, but about those things you've heard about the Holy Spirit, the things you've heard about angels, the things you've heard about divine visitations. For well, remember what was prophesied of Joel, <coughs> that in the end, last days, and actually in the Old Testament, in Joel, it says the end of days. <coughs> Excuse me. It's a little dry out here for me. Do you folks notice the dry? <laughs> but in the end of days, <coughs> I will pour out my spirit upon you, all flesh. Your young men shall see visions, your old men dream dreams, and you know the prophecies. He said, there will be a visitation of angels. <coughs> be not afraid, but take heed even, the, even in those days. Uh, and he said, it will seem, uh, I, I'm going to have to skip around because this is kind of a long, long prophecy that came. And um, he said, there, in those days there shall come a mighty manifestation of the Spirit, and the work that God intended should be done in these last days shall be accomplished. God's work is going to be done. Nothing can stop it. Nothing can hinder it. The time is short. And the manifestation shall come, manifestation shall come, and the glory of the Lord shall rest upon it and rest upon thee. And his glory shall be round about. 
And the cloud will come, and let's say about this place right here, and fill this house. And yea, it will seem as though the whole building is filled with smoke, because you see, the glory of the Lord will be in manifestation. And great, great will be the noise thereof. And praise and adoration will go up from his people. And it shall be noised abroad. And men shall come from afar. And they shall hear about it. And men from afar shall come to behold it. For men, as men grow more... No, and I'm going to read this too. I started to skip it. For the Lord shall be in manifestation in those days, when all ways he ever manifested himself, both in the old covenant and in the new covenant, plus the multiplying of the Spirit in the power of God in these days. For men, as men grow more wicked and more wicked, and Satan, because he knows his time is short, and all of his cohorts and evil spirits go about as never before to devour, even while that's going on, the power of God, the glory of God, shall be increased and shall be multiplied, and it shall flow like a mighty river, flow like a mighty river, Flow like a mighty river, the Spirit of God, and not only hundreds and thousands, but millions will be swept into the flow of that river. And they shall flow, flow forth in praise and glory. For the glory of the Lord is in manifestation. The glory of the Lord will be seen on the faces of the saints. The glory of the Lord shall shine forth until men and women will walk into places of business and people will fall down and cry out to God though they say nothing to them, for the glory of the Lord will shine through them. The manifestation of his power and of his glory is reserved unto this hour. Now here's the part that just thrills me. As you Listen really closely. As you walk with the Lord, as you prepare your heart, as you feed upon his word, as you listen to what the Spirit of God says, your heart shall be prepared, and your mind will be changed until you flow in the supernatural as naturally as a bird flies through the air. Until you flow in the supernaturally as a fish swims in the water. You will flow in the supernatural naturally as you breathe the very air. You'll not be conscious of what's going on around you. You'll be conscious of the flow of the Spirit. And he will manifest himself. And he will accomplish what he desires. For these are the last days. And these are the end times. So walk in it. Run in it. Fly. Spiritually speaking. You shall enjoy the fullness of what is provided for you. Hallelujah. So, for our immediate future, not far down the line, this great, and I'll tell you on our Wednesday calls, how many of you are on our Wednesday calls? We are experiencing this. We are flowing in something supernatural, as naturally, while that call is going on. And this is our little, you all just, you know, praise the Lord, but we're talking us that are on the Wednesday calls. While Max is, while those things are coming, it's so supernatural. But doesn't it seem natural? Doesn't it seem as you write and God is speaking to us? Hallelujah. We have calls every Wednesday morning at 8 o'clock. And then we have another at noon. And without a doubt, I can tell you we hear God through tongues and interpretation. And the interpretation is heard by a, an, a, an Arab-speaking man. And we hear what God is saying. It's, it's amazing. Bless the Lord. So I do know some things that are coming. He says to us things that are coming. We watch things. We hear things. Hallelujah. Politically? I could tell you some things coming politically, but let me just say this. Boy Scout motto. Be prepared. <laughs> How do you prepare? Just the way he said. Feed on the Spirit. Feed on the Word. Listen to the Spirit. Stay close to God. Hallelujah. Get everything in your life in a position that you can hear him. I told my grandson today, when I was talking to him about what's coming there in California, he said it started to rain already. I said, well, you know to do this and this. You know how to stand in your authority. Da -da -da -da. 
And uh, I said, also, you might fill the bathtub with water uh, in case you need it to flush your potties. And he said, oh, we hadn't thought of that, bless the Lord. <laughs> if the electricity should go out or something, you know. So just listen to God. He'll tell you what to do. Does he ever tell you when you're out driving, go this way? Don't go that way. And you, you do it, don't you? You obey him, bless the Lord. So that's, what is your future? That's what I'm talking about. What is your future? Now, what is our future? We're looking for a great move of God. Now, what is going on now with God? He is building us. He's building the body of Christ. Ephesians 2.20. You are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. In whom all the building fitly framed together grows. Unto an holy temple in the Lord. In whom you also are builded together for and habitation of God through the Spirit. The church on the earth, the body of Christ, is being builded for to be inhabited and filled with God, and then manifested to the principalities and powers. Oh, this is juicy stuff. If we had time to go through the book of Ephesians, the purpose of the ages is that we manifest God. We're the body of Christ. We're to manifest him to the principalities and powers, manifest him to men and women upon the earth. And like you said, what are we manifested before? That's the devil's old trick. Get us fight and fuss and all that jazz. So we couldn't manifest God. But it's his will that we do, and we're going to. Bless the Lord. Now, Moses built the tabernacle. And Exodus 40, when he finished, it said, So Moses finished the work, and it was filled with the glory. Solomon built the temple, and it says, Solomon finished the work. The work, the work, the good work. And what happened? The glory of the Lord filled the temple and all the priests fell over. The Holy Ghost is building a temple. And he's not going to be the first one that fails. He is going to build us. And that's what's going on now until we are known as a glorious church. Hallelujah. Ephesians 5.25. Bless the Lord. You should do meditation in the book of Ephesians. Husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself, actually, it says, for her. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word in order that he may present himself to himself a glorious church. He's going to be the most glorious bridegroom ever there was, and we're going to be the most glorious bride. Hallelujah. He's not coming for a church. Half backslid in bed with the world. So one of the things that's going to happen, and happen to us, in this time and the very near future, is you're going to know a great big change. A change in you. And look at the man there, woman next to you. You're going to see a big change in them. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. And we're going to be changed and changed and changed from glory to glory to glory to glory until there's only one more step out of here. And that will be the cap sheath of the glory, and that's what's going to happen in the rapture of the church. Now, I'm going to read you the scripture about the rapture of the church. This is 1 Thessalonians 4.13. All the Bible's for the church, but not all the Bible's about the church. The part of the Bible that's to the church, for the church, about the church, is the New Testament epistles and letters. That's where you find yourself, and that's where you find your future. That's where you live now. So I'm going to just read this through first, and then we're going to go back over it. The rapture, pre-tribulation rapture. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Falling asleep, I have. That you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that means this is doctrine, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not pre prevent or precede them which are fallen asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. That's the first thing you'll hear. Then the voice of the archangel, second. And then the shofar, the trump of God. 
and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So at the beginning of that Shemitah cycle, that seven years, we're going to be caught up in the rapture of the church. Now, I want Terry to come up here. And he had so many supernatural things. Uh, he is a graduate of uh, Panhandle State University. And this was his church when he was here. And uh, he had so many, many spiritual experiences while he was here. Um, but I want this one right here. It's so very, very... Uh, <laughs> you'll like it. Bless the Lord, son. So tell it, tell it with all the detail. Well, uh, of course, I was renting a house, and uh, I had the neighbor there who was, a, at the time, the alcoholic uh, anonymous uh, counselor. And then I had my wild roommate who, who liked to go to bars, drink, and all that. And then there was me. And uh, so anyway, the counselor uh, needed this U-joint changed in his van. And he asked me if I'd do it, and I said, sure. He had to get to Oklahoma City. The next yeah, he had to get to Oklahoma City the next morning. For something yeah. with Alcoholics yeah, Anonymous. some sort of meeting. So I was underneath that Dodge van, and my roommate that's kind of wild, he said, uh, Terry, do you mind? You know how it is when you get under a truck or a vehicle. You don't really want to get out. I really don't know how that is, but I can imagine. <laughs> he said, Terry, do you mind getting out, uh, out of there for a minute? I want to show you something. And so I got out of the truck. It's dark. And uh, we look into the sky. And he shows me a little red dot. He goes, what do you think that is? I said, I don't know. It, uh, maybe it's a satellite. I don't know, Randy. And so um, we left it at that. I hadn't been under there three or four minutes. He said, Terry, I'm sorry. Do you mind getting up one more? Do you mind getting out and looking at this? I said, all right. I got out, out of there. I looked up. And uh, there's more than one red dot now in the sky. There's several. How, do, how many remembers this? Well, go ahead and tell us. Okay. It. You haven't told it yet. How they remember? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I get back into that van, and, and I'll tell you the truth. I'm just kind of laying there going, what's going on there? And he said, Terry, and he said some words. He says, you've got to get out of here. And all three of us look into the sky, and we watch the sky break out into, like, measles and then start bleeding into one, like, blood red. And, you know, back then... Guyman was, um, there was, they were big into cattle feedlots and they were moving cattle all the time in these semi trucks and that all just went quiet. You could just always hear the cows. Dead yeah. quiet. I never heard Guyman quiet back then. <laughs> and when it went quiet, the counselor said, Oh my God, Jesus is coming again. And that roommate that's wild I was talking about, he went down the road screaming. That's the only, just, I never knew where he went. He just started screaming and, and ran down the road. <laughs> and so I'm left here with the counselor, and uh, I said, well, I didn't uh, want to fix your van, to be honest with you. And he said, I didn't want to go to Oklahoma City. <laughs> we'll just wait for the Lord. He's coming. I said, yeah, he is. Can you What's hear that? What's the sky look like? It was look, blood, like blood. And it was Palm Sunday night. So we he said thought, the dogs didn't bark? No. Cows nothing. didn't move? No trucks, no semis, nothing. Anybody remember that? You guys remember that? Oh, my God. <laughs> and so we went and sat on the porch a little bit and said, well, we'll just wait for the rapture. <laughs> You know, you're having real talk. You're saying, like, uh, God, please forgive me for, <laughs> you know, we're doing that to each other. I missed it here, Lord, because back in those days, you know, like I said, I, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have smoked and all that stuff, and I ask you to forgive me. And, and uh, any, any little, you're just getting them out, out of the way. But, <laughs> but we notice we're not going anywhere. And he goes, you think we missed the rapture? <laughs> 
I said, I know a surefire way of finding out. My mom's a preacher. I'll call home, and I'll know if she's home, we're all right. <laughs> so I called home, and Dad answers the phone. Well, I knew he'd miss it. <laughs> I said, Dad, where's Mom? And he goes, I'm not kidding you. He, she was here a minute ago, and now I can't find her. <laughs> I said... <laughs> I said to my dad, Dad, look at the sky. You missed a rapture of me and you both. He goes, what are you talking about? And so he went out. I heard the phone ring put down. And, you know, this is before cell phones. And he goes out there and he looks and he goes, well, the sky ain't right here. And I said, you need to find mom if you can, Dad, because I'm, I'm concerned. <laughs> mom, what, do you, you called back. Well, what had happened, I had been in the house, you know, just kind of June and around like you do. And I, we, we had an old house built in 1907, and in the back of it was a pump, you know, a water pump. And, and I went out and sat on that, and I was praying out there. So I'd been there in the house, but I'd left. And he couldn't find me. So Terry thought, he, he said, Dad, you and I have missed the rapture. <laughs> and, I, and I believed it with all my heart. I thought we did. <laughs> what did it feel like? It felt like nothing else that you ever did mattered in your life. You know, you were all alone, kind of like thing. And, and uh, there was two of us that felt like that. And of course, it didn't help that Randy went down the road screaming. <laughs> so bless the Lord, that's a very real experience of missing the rapture. And uh, thank you, son. I appreciate that. But um, bless the Lord. Hallelujah. It's real. It really will be real, real, real. And I want you to, uh, there's a lot of people right now who are saying, I even heard one so-called prophet, and I believe he, he is prophetic, and he said, just forget about the rapture. Uh, we're going to be here. No, we're not going to be here a long, long time. And there are some, it always comes up every now and then that we're going to establish the kingdom on the earth and then hand it over to God. That is not right. Jesus will hand the kingdom over to God. He's the stone cut out without hands that hits that Nebuchadnezzar's image. And so um, the rapture is coming, and it's coming not far away. Uh, I, I know about Shemitah cycles and when they are, and I know an upcoming one. So I look at the upcoming beginnings, and if it's not that one, I say, well, it'll be the next maybe. But I wanted to go through this scripture with you. And, um, and, and put it into you because you're going to, uh, some people say that we'll miss the rapture. We won't. But, I mean, the church. So here we go. Uh, this is 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. We're not supposed to be ignorant about this. Somebody said, it seems we're more ignorant about the things he said don't be ignorant about than anything else. One of them, remember, he said, don't be ignorant about the gifts of the Spirit. So he, he wants you to know about this. Concerning them, which are actually, this is a crisis time. Uh, this is the first letter ever written, the letter to the Thessalonians. And what had happened, Jesus had come. He'd gone out there, you know, on the Mount of Olives. He'd gone up into heaven, and the angels or whoever those heavenly beings were said, this same Jesus is coming again. They were looking for him to come again any time. After all, he'd been walking 40 days in and outdoors, you know, and out, I mean, without doors, through walls, ceilings, whatever. And he'd been appearing to 500, and, and so they were looking for him to come back. And a crisis had happened. People were dying, and he hadn't come back yet. And so you know how murmurs go around, well, maybe it's not right, maybe we shouldn't have left the Jewish, and on and on. So he said, I don't want you ignorant. Now here's, here's the deal. Concerning them which are falling asleep. The Bible never says about saints that they die. It says they depart, they change their tents, their house, but they don't die. The, concerning them which fall asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and you have to believe that to get saved, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Those who have already, when Jesus comes, the rapture of the church, they'll be with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, 
shall not prevent or precede them which are fallen asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and, that's a, and that word shout is the word uh, in, 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 that means a shout of command. I think he'll say, come up hither. And then the second one, the voice of the archangel, and then the shofar, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Bless the Lord. Now, I say that if I had a prior notice of the rapture, I would go to Prior, Oklahoma. And I would stand in the Prior, Oklahoma cemetery. And there is my handsome husband's body. He was, and it used to be handsome, it'll be handsomer. And um, then mom and dad are not far away from there. And then my sister, my only sister, who, who uh, moved to heaven when she was only 42, my only sibling, uh, her body's there. So if I had advance notice, I would go stand there in that cemetery, and here they would come. Here would be Jesus, and they would be after him, following him, and then up out of the grave would come their bodies, and their spirits would join, and they would be glorified be just before us. But we too, we're not going to be before them, but we too will be glorified, and then we will all go up for the married supper of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Isn't that great news? Bless the Lord. So um, it's just like Charlie, you know. I mean, wouldn't you like to be there uh, and see him coming? You will. You'll see him come. And then we'll all have glorified bodies like unto his glorified bodies and go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, since there has been um, a lack, I think, of good teaching about the rapture, I contacted my very good friend, Rick Renner, and I asked him to help me uh, with the words here. The word, some people are, they get upset because the word rapture is not in the Bible, but we don't need it because we've got this word, harpazo. And harpazo is a Greek word. We don't need rapture. And it's the one translated in the New Testament, caught away. So here's what uh, Rick sent me. Billy, below is what I wrote in one of my study guides from a series I did called The Coming of the Antichrist. Anyway, here is what I wrote leading to the word harpazo, and that's spelled H-A-R-P-A-D-Z-O. Immediately, and these are all Rick's words I'm reading you right now. Immediately after the resurrection of the dead in Christ, the rapture of those alive in Christ will occur. The word then in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4.17 1 Thessalonians 4.17, uh, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. The word then is the word epiata, which means upon that moment, exactly at that time, exactly then. The believers will be caught up together with the dead in Christ who have been resurrected. The phrase caught up together in the Greek word is the Greek word, uh, which is a form of harpazo, and it means to catch, seize, take away, to snatch suddenly. It carries the idea of snatching someone out of danger just in time. This tells us that the rapture of the church will occur in a dangerous moment when things seem to look ominous. Christ is going to come suddenly and snatch us out of danger just in the nick of time. When the Bible says we will meet the Lord in the air, the word meet is apontesis in Greek, and it means to the meeting, to the reception, to the encounter. It is a technical word used for the reception of a newly arrived official or royalty. Of course, that would be Jesus. In other words, when we meet Jesus in the air, he is going to roll out the red carpet for us. He is going to give us a VIP reception, and it is going to be grand. So the meeting in the air is that royal reception. The word air is a Greek word that describes the lower regions of the heavens, the lower atmosphere. So we know right where it is. Greek tells you which atmosphere, which, which level. So as Christ gives a shout, and the archangel voices his arrival... The Lord will descend from heaven into the lower regions of the atmosphere. 
His shout will galvanize the angelic troops and resurrect the dead in Christ. And the Lord himself will seize and snatch us away from imminent danger. It will be a VIP reception, and from then on, we will ever be with the Lord. In Greek, the phrase ever be is pantote, and it indicates at all times, all the time, always, continually, perpetually. So that word harpazo, here's where it's used in the Bible other places. 2 Corinthians 12, 2, we know that he's talking about himself, Paul. I knew a man in Christ 14 years ago, whether above 14 years, whether in the body or out, I cannot tell. Such an one caught up, and that was, is harpazoed. 2 Corinthians 12, 4, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable things, which is not lawful for man to utter. And then it's used of Philip, Acts 8, 39. And when they were coming up out of the water, you remember the, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch that he baptized? When they were coming up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, harpazoed Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. And then of, of the King Messiah, Revelation 12, 2, and she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child, that would be Jesus, Israel, is the one who brought forth Jesus. And he was caught up to God and to his throne. So that's our pazzo, and we don't need the word rapture because we have a word which explains it exactly as it shall be. So don't forget about the rapture. Bless the Lord. After the rapture, I believe the first stop is uh, the judgment seat of Christ. Now, you're born again. Your spirit's born again, becomes a brand new man in Christ, a species that never was before. But from that, by grace are you saved through faith, but from that point on, good works count. And the Bible says we were ordained to walk in good works. And so we're going to go to a place called the judgment seat of Christ. Now, accountability. It seems that, I don't know, it seems to me uh, that the, the modern day uh, church, you might say, a whole lot of them don't feel they're very accountable. But we are accountable. And I worked for Kenneth E. Hagan, and I remember the day I was sitting at my desk, he walked out the door, he got hold of, his, of the knob, the doorknob, and he turned around to me and he said, I live every day. Conscious of that moment when I will stand before Jesus Christ and give an accounting for this ministry. Now, I also worked um, just part-time. I would go up and do a book for Lester Sumrall every now and then after I quit working for Brother Hagen. And one day Lester was there working with me at my desk, and he turned around, grabbed the doorknob, looked back at me, and he said, I live every day of my life conscious of that moment when I will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and answer for every dime that came into this ministry. You know, Paul told people, follow me, do what I do. So I, I believe that ministers, uh, that, that's what we're accountable for. That we could say to the people, what I do, what I said, what I heard, you heard, do. Because we're going to be accountable. I'm going to be accountable for standing before you tonight. And is that something heavy? Well, it's serious. Let's just put it like that. It's something serious. He said, don't all of you desire to be teachers because they have a, a more a higher judgment. So, uh, but, bless the Lord, you get rewards. Because at the judgment seat of Christ, if you make it that far, you're in. You're not going to be out. You're in. But you're going to the judgment seat of Christ, which is a place of reward. And there you are going to be rewarded for all your good works. Bless the Lord. How did you build? Did you build with wood, hay, and stubble? Remember the building God's building? Did you build the church? Or did you criticize the church, criticize the pre preacher, uh, judge all your fellow peoples? How did you build the body of Christ? So you're going to be... There are, there, there's, there's going to be there. I don't think I put that scripture down, but there is a scripture that says, uh, he's going to say, some is wood, hay, and stubble. Going to go up and smoke. I believe that's glory smoke. 
I think the glory, it'll just poof right away. And it might be some of the things you're most proud of. But then there's going to be the gold, the silver, the precious stones of your life. Your good works that he ordained for you. Your path that you walked in. Did you get a cup of cold water? He'll reward it. Did you bake a batch of cookies? Did you go down and visit someone in prison? Did you give a smile? Anything you did to build this building, which he's building, anything you did to lead anyone to the Lord, anything is going to know reward. He is a rewarder. What is faith? We have to believe that he is and that he is what? A rewarder of those who diligently serve him. So, here's just a couple of scriptures, Romans 14, 10. Why do you judge your brother? Why do you set it not your brother? For we all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You don't want to be like Terry, <laughs> and you see the sky, <laughs> and you say, forgive me that I criticized, I talked, gossiped about Sister Jane last week. You don't want to have to do that. Bless the Lord. In fact, you're not going to have time to do that, but anyway, we're moving right along. 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Hallelujah. And that's in the Bible. Is this the same? It's in the same Bible as John 3.16. And so there is an accountability. Bless the Lord. Then, I believe after that, we're going to the wedding supper, and there will be a presentation. We will be presented to Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, 2. I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband. This is Paul writing. That I may, pre that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 14. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise us up also by Jesus and shall present us with you. Holy Ghost is going to present us. Colossians 1, 21. Oh you, oh, you talk about it. Oh, there's never been a wedding on earth like that one. No, no, no England can't put it on. We, we, we've watched those weddings. They, they, they pale in the light of that reception that we've got the wedding reception and the presentation of the bride. Colossians 1, 21, 22. You that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he hath reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Jude 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory. And then remember what Jesus said, that he has, hallelujah, um, Christ loved the church. This is Ephesians 25, 5.25, we read it before. Brethren, uh, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, Revelation 19. Turn there in your Bible. Dun, da, da, dun. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We're going to be going to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Now, that's the seven-year Shemitah time. Uh, weddings in um, Orthodox homes in those days took a week, seven days, the way it went on. Now, we're going to the wedding supper of the Lamb, and that is in, um, hallelujah, that is going to be in, hallelujah, I have brought my Bible that is not marked up. Bless the Lord. Got it. Hallelujah. Um, now, on earth, there's going to be the tribulation period that we call the wrath. The wrath of God is going to be poured out. Now, the church will not be here. It is not going to be here during the time that the wrath is poured out. The wrath is poured out in 
Revelation 6. Bowls of the prayers of the saints. Revelation, Revelation 8. The intercessory prayer that wasn't yielded to will be poured out in judgment on the earth. And earth will have a time of tribulation called the wrath of time. The wrath of God. Now, I want you to look at some scriptures which prove the church will not go through that time. Uh, well, turn to Revelation 6, 16. Here's when the wrath comes. Revelation 6. You're so quiet out there. But there's a lot, lot of serious things, huh? And uh, Revelation 6. Bless the Lord. 16. And said to the mountains and the rocks, this is people on earth, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? That's going to be going on here on the earth. Now, we're not going to be in on that. How do we know? The letters, rightly dividing the word, remember the letters tell us our future. Romans 5, 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 5.9 God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So you're not going to be down here going through the tribulation. And um, if you know how to rightly divide the word, you can see a difference between Matthew 24 and Luke 21. And uh, some people try to prove uh, that we're going through uh, the tribulation with scriptures in Matthew 24, which have to do with uh, who's here, the Jews and the nations. So there'll still be people here on the earth. You remember how Terry thought he got left? There will be some people left here. And it doesn't automatically mean they're going to hell. When you read about the judgment of the nations in Matthew 25, it says he's coming in his glory and all the angels with him and before him shall be gathered the nations and he will divide them. That's the judgment of the nations. Nations as nations will know judgment. And they will. you're not going to end up in a goat pile. You won't even be there except you will have been glorified and, and looking in. The Bible says you'll be judging the angels even. So these people on the earth Sheep nations, they're going to go into the millennial age. They're going to have babies, the Bible says. Their life is going to be, they're, they're extended. Their, their, their life is elongated. They're going to have a life like, uh, like Adam, and even better. And uh, the Bible says that they're going to so populate the earth that one day the oceans will have to be reduced. So it's an amazing thing. There are people, your, your Bibles are not going to rapture with you. And I could prove to you from Matthew 24 that God's talking to them, some of them. When you read this, do this. Hallelujah. So there are people, Jews and nations, who will be here on this earth. Uh, thank God that was not a Terry's fate. Bless the Lord. But it had been the real rapture. Um, I don't think it would have appeared like blood in the sky. He would have appeared in the sky. But, but bless the Lord if it had been like that. Praise God. Uh, Terry... Would have had his life extended because I know when he says, if you did this to my brethren, the Jews, he's talking about. Did you visit them when the Antichrist was after them? Did you protect them? Da, 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 da. However you bless Israel, you be blessed. So there are going to be some who do that. But not you. You and I. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Here comes Jesus. Here's the voice. We're out. I'm out at the Prior Cemetery. And there is Kent going up and my sister and meeting their and then we're glorified and we go up to be with the Lord and we will be with him forever and ever and ever. And we're going to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Never been, never been any kind of pomp and circumstance put on like that's going to be. We're going to have wedding music. Here it is in verse 6 of Revelation 19. And I heard as it were, the voice of a multitude, a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, 
For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. That's where Handel got the words. I believe it's going to be our wedding music. Handel went into a room for three weeks and had supernatural move of God and came out with a, came out with a manuscript and tears on it. We're going to have wedding music. I believe, it'll, I believe it probably is. All of that in the Messiah, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God. All of that's about this. I believe it'll be the wedding music. Let us be glad, verse 7, and rejoice. And give honor to him, for the marriage supper of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, John, of course, has been taken into the day of the Lord, and John the Beloved, and he's seeing all this, and he's got a guide. And this guide is uh, probably someone from earth who's gone to heaven already. And uh, he fell down. It, it was so wondrous that John just fell down at his feet, his guide, and began to worship him. And the guide said, the heavenly being, John said, I fell at his feet, and he said to me, See thou do it not. I'm your fellow servant, and of thy brethren. He's a, he's a man, a person who's been, been to heaven. And, the, and I, am of, I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren, which is the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And then the scene changes. The wedding supper, the wedding music, the wedding clothing described, the groom, us. But the scene changes. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. I think we've placed our crowns there. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him. Not the armies which are down here on earth fighting the Antichrist. No, we're, with, we're his church army and we're in heaven. And the armies which were in heaven followed him. I'm sure the angel army too, but the church army, the bride army. But here we are. The angels, the armies, verse 14, which were in heaven followed him up on white horses. Clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Hallelujah. Who wears this fine linen, white and clean? The church, the body of Christ. It's already told you who wears this. So that means you and I are going to be following him. Now when he comes in the rapture of the church, he comes to make love. When the scene changes, he's coming to make war. Because down here on the earth, the unholy trinity, Satan, the dragon... The Antichrist and his system, the false prophet, have surrounded Jerusalem. You can read about this war in Zechariah 12 and Zechariah 14. Surrounded Jerusalem, and they think, aha, we're going to get those Jews now. They've been after them all this time. Anti-Semitism is from Satan. Sister Jeannie Wilkerson said once, there's going to come a time when God and Jesus and heaven, the church, and the devil are all going to agree. And that's going to be, heaven's going to call us. We're going to be glad to be gone. And the devil's going to be glad to get rid of us. So there will be an agreement. And with us out of the way, he thinks at last he can get rid of those chosen people about who are supposed to come and rule the earth. And here he has them surrounded. Oh, I love to go on this in a long, long period, but we don't have it. So that's what's going on on earth. And here he's coming on his white horse. His, are, his eyes are flames of fire. And we're all on white horses behind him. Coming back with him to that battle that's going on down there against the Jews. Now, Sister Jenny Wilkerson, um, huh, 
Bless the Lord. She has a couple of experiences with white horses she's seen from heaven, but I'm just going to tell you one of them. And uh, she loved to pray. Have you any of you ever heard her prophesy or seen her on YouTube? You should, you should get Jeannie Wilkerson on YouTube. She was a woman that Brother Hagen, she prophesied to him more than any other and the one that he, he, went, he trusted most. She's a great woman of prayer, but what a prophet. You should go on YouTube if you even don't want to watch the whole time she's on. Just hear her. Just hear her voice. I was filled with God. And so Sister Jeannie was a prayer warrior and a prophetess, great Bible teacher. And she loved to kneel when she prayed. And uh, she broke her leg. And they're taking her to the hospital. And she's in, I don't know if it was an ambulance or car, but she had a window. She could look out. And she was so sad because she couldn't kneel and pray. And there was a horse traveling along right beside, a white horse. And she said, what's that? And the Lord said, that's your horse. He said, every believer has a horse, a white horse. And he said, it is, he said, you think things on earth are personalized, monogram shirts, monogram towels. He said, that's nothing. He said, heaven is personalized for you. Everything about it, your home, everything about it. And your horse is personalized for you. And he said, your horse is gated, paced, according to how closely you followed me. If you followed me closely in your earth walk, then your horse will be up front. But let's just say, for instance, if your wife had to drag you to church tonight, yours could be in the back. <laughs> Don't you know that Brother Charlie Mendenhall has quite a horse? I'm sure he's seen him, grooms with him, probably has him over to his house every day. Bless the Lord. But you've got a horse. And it's gated to how closely you follow God. Bless the Lord. And so they are there on their white horses. Hallelujah. Following him. And the armies, verse 14, which were in heaven, followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations. He's going to judge those nations down there. You remember sheep and goat nations. <clears throat> and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of God, almighty God. And he hath on his vester and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. He goes down to the battle. He takes the beast, and he puts him in the false prophet, these both, verse 20, the end of it, were cast into the lake, burning with fire. But he didn't put the devil right in, the in there yet, not the Satan. He's going to tie him up for a thousand years and then loose him at the end of that thousand years. So that's over in the end of the seventh day. So I want you to have a, a look at your future because we're in these times. And um, in eternity, if you'll put up that, um, that chart of days again, Bless the Lord. God is not at all limited by time. Isaiah 57 says, He, the high and holy one, dwells in eternity. Uh, a, a great Bible teacher, Dr. Roy Hicks, came to Raymond, do you remember? And he taught us about time. And he said, eternity. He said, you can imagine, think of eternity like this. There's a wagon wheel. In the midst of it, here sits God. That's eternity. And you can look down any spoke of time. He can look down any spoke of time. I have just got back from Australia. I was there for six weeks. Thank God. Did about 25 meetings, seven churches and two uh, conferences. And then came back, went to Washington, D.C., and then Southwest Believers, and here I am. And I'm going to be 85 years old in December. But you know what? God has quickened me. Hallelujah. He renews my youth like the eagles. There's a little bit thrown in extra here. I'm really strong and I'm full with energy. And uh, so we were out at Paramount last Wednesday and there was a lady there, one of the prayers, and she said, you know, my mother's your age. 
and all she can do is sit in a chair all day and then get up to go to the bathroom, that's it. And then I think about you, what's the difference? And I, was, I told Terry tonight, we were talking about it, I thought about it. It's the power in God's Word. He said to us on the prayer call the other day, you live by my power. And I worked for Kenneth Hagin early when I was a young woman and found out that you have what you say. And you didn't have to be sick, bless the Lord. And so I put together a group of divine health and healing scriptures, and they're online. And I say those scriptures every day, and I've said them for years. And one of the things I say is Psalm 103, in which it ends with, he renews my youth like the eagles. And one from Job, which says, uh, her flesh shall be fresher than a child's. And then Psalm 91 is in there in Isaiah 53. And Chip said, Mom, you do these every day? I said, yes, I do them every day, son. It takes me about 10 minutes. I said, imagine that against all the time I could be sitting in a doctor's office waiting for an appointment. <laughs> it works. God's Word is filled with power. But you have to work it. It has to be in your mouth, in your heart, and in your mouth. And then you speak it out. And you have what you say. This is what I have. Because I've been saying it for years and years. Well, maybe you didn't start years ago. Well, start tonight. Start tomorrow. Go online. Get my divine health and healing scriptures. So say them. And watch it. Watch what happens. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, where was I? Oh, here we are. The first, this was my 11th trip to Australia. It takes a long time to get there, but I was sent with a purpose, and there's a long story. I won't tell you about that. But on my first trip back from Australia, uh, the Lord spoke to me about time. And uh, I had played a trick on my daughter Brenda. Her son Jared was just a little kid at that time, and he was one of those acquisitive little kids that asked a gene questions. And he was driving, his Aunt Shelley was driving him to a, have you ever been to Branson on Christmas, Ozark Christmas, and see all the lights we have? Thousands and millions probably. And so he, she, she's driving the kids to a basketball game over somewhere else, and they're all in the car, and Jared's popping questions. And she, he says to her, uh, Aunt Shelley, how many lights do you think there are in Branson from Main Street to such and such? She said, Jared, don't ask me any more questions. And he, she said, I'm driving. And he said, oh, Aunt Shelley, I was just going to ask you one more. Okay, one more. Uh, what do you think uh, those black holes in space are? Jared, she said, shut up. <laughs> well, that gives you Jared. So I call home from Australia, and Jared answers the phone. You know, in Australia, I got back from there. It was winter. Here it's summer, and the time is very different. You can actually leave Sydney and fly to Los Angeles and arrive in Los Angeles by the clock before you left Sydney. So I'm, on the, I'm coming back, and I, uh, this is the only time in all my 11 trips the pilot ever did this. But he said, we have just passed the international date line. And God spoke to me, and I heard his voice plainly. I didn't write it down because I didn't know I was going to say this tonight, but I do my best to remember it. He said, it said, God invented time scientifically, mathematically, God cut out, measured out, God measured out a piece of eternity and called it time for his dealings with man. Every second of time counts off time until the end of time and its usefulness to God. The only reason he needed time was to fix the fall. So this is time. 7,000 years, you might say. 6,000 plus 1,000. That 1,000 is the millennial reign. But before here, what do we have? Eternity passed. And after that seventh day, what have we got? Eternity future. So I wanted to read to you another prophecy. This one came through Brother Kenneth Copeland. And it's a glimpse. We don't have a whole lot into eternity future about what it will be. I, I believe we'll be. And in this prophecy, it does say that we will be developing the stars. 
It says, right now, this is Brother Copeland's prophecy, I will have a glorious church and the gates and authority of hell will not prevail against it. And then he talks about eternity future. Bless the Lord. So I'm going to just read a little part of this. For these are the days of the greatest revelations of all. In the future, out in the distant ages that you know nothing of, I'll give you a glimpse of what it will be like. Never again, never in any age, never in the future again will there be the likes of you. You will walk the streets of the cities, of the planets, and the stars. I built the universe for you, and you'll travel it with me. And all of those that shall be born in the future, now these are the people on the earth with longevity restored, all of those that shall be born in the future, and all of the years to come, as natural men and natural women, will populate the planets and stars. And they'll say to one another, <clears throat> there comes one of the kings. There comes one of the special ones. There comes the image of the master. Oh, that we had lived in that age. They are so special. They get the best of everything. Their father keeps them in his bosom. Oh, we have it blessed. And we have it good. But it's because of them. They walk in the glory realm. realm. They walk in the light realm. We have joy. They have ecstasy. That's your future. It's as bright as God can make it. This marvelous being, never again will there be anything like us. There's going to come a day when the very last person comes into the body of Christ. And the body of Christ will be complete. And from that time on, nobody can get into this marvelous creation that we are. The very body of Christ himself. The last one will come in. That's in the word. The last one will come in. Hallelujah. And there will never be anything like us again. So, I want you to consider right now, are you in that body? Are you in that body of Christ? Have you made that a surety in your life? How do you do it? Romans 10, 9, and 10, you have to believe that Jesus died for your sins, but that God raised him from the dead. And then you invite him into your heart. If you're here tonight and you've never done that, make sure you do. You won't want to be like Terry was. Bless the Lord. Oh, no. I've missed the rapture. Hallelujah. And then... You've got a little time to get the pace of your horse quickened. You know how you, 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 you train horses? These horses are going to respond to how you lived. They're up there rooting for you. They want to be up at the front too. Your horse, he's there right now. Sister Wilkinson has told every one of us have got one. Bless the Lord. So you've got a little time. Is your, is your horse closely following Jesus? Are you following Jesus closely enough that your horse can have a good, good place in that army coming back? Are you one of those who's hanging back there? You know, and some of your works are going to go up wood, hay, and stubble. And you barely... The Bible says some of them uh, will be saved as if by fire. You don't want to be one of those. No. Hallelujah. So these are things for us to think about. Won't you all stand? Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. And just uh, close your eyes and talk to the Lord. And if you have to make any confessions, make them. If you have to say to the Lord, Lord, you know what repent means? It means you turn. You turn from what it was. You make a U-turn. You turn right around from it. First off, I want to see the hands of anybody that you're not really sure. 
that you're in the body of Christ. You can't be in this body. He has no grandchildren. You can't be in there because your mother was or your grandmother. You have to be there because you made a decision in your heart to invite Jesus to come in and change you to a brand new person. So I'd like to know, I'd like to look around and see if you are, you want to make sure tonight, you have not made sure before, and you want to make sure tonight, because I'm telling you folks, these things are upon us, the signs of the time, oh my goodness. So raise your hand if you'd like to make sure your salvation sure tonight. And we'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. Hallelujah. We see a hand. Where is it? I can't see out there very well. Where is that hand? Put it up so I can see it. You raised your hand. I see it there on the back row back there with the green shirt. Oh, my Jesus. Dear brother, would you mind to come, come up here and let me pray for you? Would you just step on out and let me pray for you? Come on up. We all had to do this. God needs people in his army that are strong. I told Chip, don't let them buy with just those, well, back there, wherever you are, da da da, da. Okay, that works. But I'm telling you in that army of the Lord, God wants some people that will walk the aisle for him. God wants the people that will come to the front and say, Look at me, devil. Look at me, Satan. Look at me, people. Hallelujah. Brother Brad, would you come on up here and, and pray for this man? Brother Brad. Everybody put your hand up toward him. Pray. If there's anybody else in here, and he's already broken the ice. You can come on. Come on. Be a brave one. I'm telling you, God. I've known of him. I told a man the other day, when I see you, and you got saved. There's hope for anybody. There's hope for every man. Doesn't matter what condition you're in. Doesn't matter what you look like to other people. Matters what you say in your heart to God. Maybe, I was telling you one time, I was in a Baptist church, going to a Baptist church, and the Baptist preacher's wife got saved. She had gone through Baptist University in Shawnee. But she had never in her own spirit. Her parents were believers. She'd walked all that religious road, but she had never had that time when she was sure Jesus came into her heart. You might be here and be like that. You can come in all kinds of conditions, all kinds of things, all kinds of ways. But if you're here in that condition and you've walked a religious road, Maybe gone to the church your grandmother did, your grandparents did. Well, after all, I believe in God. Well, did you ever have that encounter with him? So is there someone here who's like that? I feel like there is. I feel like there's someone like that. Bless the Lord. You're not sure. You're not sure. Brother Brad, help me look around. Help me look around here. Turn around here and see. Anybody who's got their hand up? Back there, do you have your hand up? or Do you? No? Uh-huh. I, I sense there's somebody here that you're kind of dependent on religion. But you didn't have that life-changing experience. Is there anyone like that? Well then, here we go. How many of you know that you need to quicken the pace of your horse? I want you to get out from your seat and come right down here in the front right now. Bless the Lord. Out from your seat, you make a move toward God. He needs brave soldiers, brave army. Not people who just hope nobody notices, but you want them to notice. 
You might have one of the fastest horses in the room, but you know he could be faster. And you're coming down here. Bless the Lord. Because you're going to make a dedication to God right now. You're going to make a dedication to God. No more playing around. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Glory to God. Father, I want you to talk to Jesus yourself. You talk to the Father. You talk to Him. You close your eyes and you talk to Him. So your ears can hear. The ones next to you, they don't have to hear. Bow. He's bowing down here. Hallelujah. Hey, he's bowing. Bless the Lord. I'm telling you, if you saw what Terry saw, Terry got to, he got his little list out right then. And he told the Lord, here is it. Here it is. So it's not me you're coming to. I don't want you to think that. It's you, God, you're coming to. God is hearing you. God sees you. You talk to him right now, plain English. Talk to him. Tell him if you need to repent from something. Tell him of what you want him to help you do. Help you believe. Oh, my God. The one man said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Oh, doubt is such a, such a thing to repent of. Repent of doubt. Don't doubt God. Repent of how you've been talking. Dear God, help me change my speech. Help me, help me change what I'm saying. Oh God. Oh Father. Oh Lord. Oh Father. Oh Lord. Help us. The Holy Spirit was, He's building the temple. He'll help you. He's called the helper. He'll help you. Help us, Lord. My God, I told me to come. I don't know what you to come. There's somebody in here, and you're just as grouchy as you could be. You're a man. And you're real grouchy. And uh, you hardly ever say a kind word to your wife children they know you as a grouch you go to church but you're a grouch your horse gonna be in the rear I can tell you right now <laughs> unless you change your ways but you got an opportunity to do it everybody bow your heads in the home is the will of the Lord. Living without strife in one accord. Don't be like those who say, oh, he doesn't hear. Oh, yes. As he said in the word, he that created it, the ear, does he not hear? He that created the eye, does he not see? Not walking in my laws, not walking in the law of love, will we'll prohibit you having the blessings I want you to have. And the things that you're griping about cannot come to you because you're not obeying my word, which is true. So, turn to me now and bow. Bow your heart. And I'm going to move on you supernaturally. And you're going to have an encounter with me. But don't you wait on that encounter. You come to me now, and I'll help you. You saw things like this long ago, and it caused you to be the way you are. But the Lord will lead you and guide you. And ere he comes, your, your progress will be far, far exceeding anything you've known in the past. And it will be sure, and it will last. You will change. You will know it, and you will show it. Your wife will know it. Your children will know it. And they're all going to have a better life till Jesus comes because you made that decision tonight. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. 
Let's just sing that, that song, just one chorus of it. All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live ah, too high for render all I have to go low I surrender all all to thee my blessed 